The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsick. This is part two of chapter two. Chapter two is called The Capitalist Unconscious, A Return to Freud. And part two is called The Labor, the Labor Theory of the Unconscious. Freud's critique of worldviews stands in continuity with the main, or the main conclusions of the interpretation of dreams. It is well known that this work, in which Freud for the first time systematized his theory of the unconscious, turns around an apparently banal statement. Dreams are wish fulfillments, yet behind this implicitly lies a complex structure that reveals the problematic status of this wish. Before entering the discussion of the Freudian dream analysis, we should recall the specificity of the epistemological weight of the Freudian approach in relation to his predecessors. Freud was certainly not the first one to attribute a theoretical value and meaning to dreams. The theoretical tradition goes back to Aristotle. In the first sections of his work, Freud leaves no doubt that he did his homework when presenting an exhaustive, detailed account an exhaustive and detailed account of the past approaches, including psychology, philosophy, literature, and so on. The interpretation of dreams proposes to move beyond their meaning to the formal mechanisms that can be recognized in the dream processes, thereby isolating their function of satisfaction. In doing so, Freud discovers that behind the production of meaning, narration, and visualization, there is another level of the dream text and another production. Here I want to focus on two main features of the Freudian notion of the unconscious. The already mentioned dimension of production, imminently doubled in the production of meaning and the production of satisfaction, and the central role of unconscious labor in the process that supports the satisfaction of the unconscious tendency. The fact that the longest, longest chapter of the interpretation of dreams engage, engages with Trauma, trauma bite, trauma bite. Dream work should be taken seriously. Psychoanalysis begins with a labor theory of the unconscious. The first complication is already on the level of terminology. In the book, Freud does not talk about desire, but wish. This terminological choice makes the structural point of Freud's analysis of satisfaction more difficult to grasp since wunch is everyday use, in everyday use designates a desire that aims us at a specific object, while big, big, big appears as d desire without a strictly determined object. From this nuance, practically all Freud's troubles in selling the idea of an unconscious wish to the scientific community emerge. I w a wish that is not simply without an object, but at the same time does not aim at an empirical, immediate or concrete object either. The unconscious desire is neither wunch nor begirty, but somehow a third category that both abolishes and complicates the dichotomy of the presence and absence of the object, or more precisely demands a rethinking of what an object is. Wish fulfillment results from the manipulation of psychic material, the day residues. This requires a consumption of energy that can, in the end, be quantified and hence understood in terms of labor power. This explains Freud's strong interest in energetics, which became crucial in his later efforts to construct an energetics of the drives, but it is already present in his abandoned early attempt to ground a positivist scientific psychology. The idea of unconscious production approached through the notion of labor power thus forms the central difference between Freud and his predecessors, who saw in the unconscious either unclear representations or psychic depth, subconsciousness. The unconscious labor also cannot be conceived without the double character of labor and capitalism. In English, this division is inscribed into language, work and labor, which cover both aspects of commodities, use value and exchange value. This linguistic inscription was already pointed out by Engels in an, in an editorial footnote to Marx's Capital. Labor which creates use values and is qualitatively determined is called work, as opposed to labor. 
Labor which creates value and is only measured quantitatively is labor, as opposed to work. Engels accentuates the opposition between qualitative and quantitative labor, between sensual qualities and discursive matter. A commodity does not merely abolish or solve the contradiction between both poles, thereby becoming matter with qualities. It consists only as this split. Engels's comment relates to the passage in which Marx links the two aspects of commodity with labor and production. On the one hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in the physiological sense, and it is in this character of being equal or abstract human labor that it creates and forms the values of commodities. On the other hand, all labor is an expenditure of human labor power in a particular form and with a definite aim, and it is in this character of being concrete, useful labor that it produces use values. Here, Marx most clearly situates the split in labor. All labor is on both sides at the same time. The question is therefore not that the commodity form would in any way encroach labor and introduce its inadequate representation. We are dealing with a parallax structure, according to which labor appears first on one side and then on the other, once as abstract matter, labor power, once as concrete form, labor process. In the same move, Marx shows that his mature critical materialist orientation implies a more sophisticated and openly anti-empiricist notion of matter, which privileges the apparently abstract discursive materiality, where labor power and surplus value can finally be thought as real discursive consequences over the misleading concrete empirical materiality whose product is an apparently un or univocal commodity. With the division between abstract and concrete labor in mind, unconscious, unconscious labor falls on the side of abstract labor, notably because it cannot be associated with a concrete psychological agent. Freud will additionally complicate the matter by showing that unconscious produ production is not univocal either. It brings about two achievements and is itself internally doubled. The satisfaction of desire thus contains two satisfactions in accordance with the double character of commodities, which now, ref which now reflects on the couple wish and desire. The minimal difference between meaning and satisfaction conserves the division of use value and value, as is also the case with meaning and linguistic value in Saussure. This, ow, this difference is noticeable in Freud's emphasis on the quantitative factor in dream work, in his insistence that the imaginary aspect of dreams should not seduce us in believing that nothing logically different takes place behind the visualization. The dream thoughts and the dream content are presented to us like two versions of the same subject matter in two different languages. Or, more properly, the dream, the dream content seems like a transcript of the dream thoughts into another mode of expression, whose characters and syn syntactic laws it is our business to discover by comparing the original and the translation. The dream thoughts are immediately comprehensible as soon as we have learnt them. The dream content, on the other hand, is expressed, as it were, in a pictographic script the characters of which have to be transposed individually into the language of the dream thoughts. If we attempted to read these characters according to their pictorial value, instead of according to their symbolic relation, we should clearly be led into error. Dreams are like commodities, hieroglyphs, the actual meaning of Bilderschrift, where meaning and value should be differentiated. Hence Freud's insistence that we should pass from the imaginary to the symbolic, the focus on Zeichen Beisehang, the relation between signs independently from their meaningful and adequate relation to images. Just like commodities, dreams too appear as an unproblematic universal experience that everyone seems to understand spontaneously. The more their formal analysis progresses, the more their complexity becomes apparent. And the deeper the gap between their pictographic script the imaginary aspect of dreams and their structure. 
And again, just as commodities, dreams bring together two languages, not the original and the translation, but the language of values and the language of meaning, need, communication, which in the end resume the split within one and the same language. These two levels do not overlap. Their interaction is merely accidental, but they both need to be taken into account in order to understand unconscious production, just as we cannot simply omit use value from the production of value, since we thereby lose the entire paradox of the commodity form. Focusing only on the consequence of dream images, the product appears to us senseless and worthless, without meaning or value, and the science of dreams, as Freud's volume was initially titled in French translation, is only possible through the shift from the appearance of meaning to the logic of value. The science of dreams is also a science of value. With this move, Freud outlines the structural background that supports both the production of meaning and a seemingly senseless sequence of images and the articulation of a demand for satisfaction that aims beyond the meaning of dreams and that can solely open up the royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious. The autonomy of the signifier that marked Lacan's first return to Freud. The interpretation of dreams without any doubt grounds psychoanalysis as a logic and not as a hermeneutic of the unconscious. Let us move on to unconscious labor. The dream work stands for various formal operations. Freud names them condensation, displacement, consideration of representability, and secondary elaboration. Unconscious labor is already implied in the inverted relation between concrete and abstract labor, which prevents the identification of unconscious labor with the psychological, psychological subject. Marx pointed out the fundamental achievement of the capitalist decentralization of labor when he claimed that the capitalist and scientific development of the means of production does not free the laborer from labor, but instead frees labor from its content, which means that labor is freed first and foremost of the empirical laborer, while the inverse, the liberation of the laborer from labor, appears as an impossible task. The liberation of labor radicalizes the dependency of the laborer on labor. It accomplishes the transformation of the subject into labor power a commodified capitalist subject. There is more at stake in this asymmetry than the fact that abstract labor simply becomes the privileged representation of all concrete forms of labor, or that exchange value abstracts from use value, thereby making of labor, too, an abstraction. Because of the asymmetrical relation between abstract and concrete labor, no return to concrete and presumably more authentic forms of labor will abolish the alienation of labor. The alienation of labor is, of course, not a result of capitalism, no more as is discursive alienation. What is its achievement, though, is the objectification of this alienation in a specific commodity. From a psychoanalytic perspective, this objectification of alienation, its materialization in a commodity, unveils a major feature of capitalism, namely that it places the subject in the position of the object, that satisfies the other's demand for production, the object that is consumed by the other for the extraction of surplus object. This precisely is Lacan's definition of perversion. As labor power, a commodity consumed for the production of value, the subject is deprived of its subjective position. Commodification of labor means as much as imposing a perverse position on the subject demanding from the subject to assume the position of the object of the other's jouissance. The main achievement of Marx's labor theory of value consisted in the fact that it reclaimed the subject's position, hence, re hence reintroducing the position of the subject in the commodity world and abolishing another imposed fantasy, according to which capital is the true subject of the valorization process. At this point, we can add another remark regarding Marx's labor theory of value, for which we are here, for which we hear that it lost its importance in times of financialization and proliferation of new technologies. Such declarations risk blurring the difference between the political economic labor theory, Smith and Ricardo, and its Marxian reformulation. The reason why Marx's theory of value preserves the predicate labor is not so much in the simplistic idea according to which labor would be the central economic category and the privileged source of value. This is what a certain branch of classical political economy seemed to have claimed 
and it was wrong. Rather, the main achievement of Marx's theory of value concerns the fact that it recognizes in labor the process, the analysis of which demonstrates that the source of value lies in inequality, exploitation, and hence in social non-relation. However, in order to think the source of value rigorously, we also need to acknowledge the participation of all the fetishist fantasies in this process. And this is another main achievement of Marx's labor theory of value. The logic of value can only be thoroughly thought in parallel with an elaborate logic of fantasy. The labor theory of value thus becomes a component of a critical science, which repeatedly evolves around the interdependency of exploitation and mystification of exploitation, which both reach their peak in the fetishization of, of capitalist abstractions. Marx's labor theory has never been more theoretically urgent and more practically relevant than in today's financial capitalism. Unconscious labor and abstract labor both lack concrete personification and embodiment since their, since their materiality consists in labor power, which the discursive apparatus isolates in the living body and which the signifier or value represents independently from the relation to the signified. Because of this lack of concrete embodiment, Marx and Freud produced two fetishizations, that is, they forced two social personifications of abstract and unconscious labor. Marx could only invent the social symptom by fetishizing the proletariat and the industrial reserve army as the point where the contradictions of the capitalist structure become, become empirical. This, of course, entails the misunderstanding that Marx's critique descends from the realm of metaphysical abstractions to the concrete analysis of social conditions and to concrete men and women. The fetishization in question maybe repeats the very same operation as commodity fetishism, but it articulates something that one might call Marx's hypothesis. The individual who is affected by capitalism is the same as the one who constitutes the subject of value. This clearly inverts the fetishist hypothesis, according to which the subject of capitalism is capital itself. The sameness of the industrial proletariat and of the subject of value implies that the industrial labor laborer in a given historic moment, the industrial revolution, embodies the split in the subject of labor and the alienation introduced by the capitalist organization of production. Their hypothetical sameness does not contradict the fact that the subject of value designates the radical alienation of the individual that embodies it. For Freud, the same privilege, equally in the given historical moment, comes to the hysteric who, was, who, from studies on hysteria onward, assumes the same function as Marx's proletariat. The hysteric does not merely embody the symptom. She is the epistemological and the social symptom, e.g. for medical knowledge, which sees in her either a pseudo-illness, simulation and hypochondria, or an inexplicable enigma around which an entire spectacle is organized. Charcot's presentations of cases in the Parisian hospital La Salpetriere had the status of theater performances and attracted not only other scientists, but also the lay, pub the lay public. In the 19th century, hysteria was the limit of scientific discourse, the point where the primacy of medical knowledge was suspended because the causes of the hysteric symptom cannot be traced back to anatomical origins solely. It was only Freud who succeeded in theorizing the hysteric as a social symptom, which on the epistemological level introduced a shift from the paradigm of the medical gaze to the paradigm, to the paradigm of the analytic ear. In other words, from the primacy of vision and observation to the primacy of speech and listening, and finally, from vulgar materialism to critical materialism. The hysteric is indeed Freud's proletarian. The notion of dream work is supposed to explain the logical mechanism of fulfillment and the structure of desire. The question that occupies Freud is why does the unconscious need to work on a detour of displacements and condensations, censorship and deformations, in order to reach satisfaction? Why can there be no unmasked and undistorted satisfaction? In order to answer this question, Freud makes the hypothesis that the relation between unconscious desire and the demands of reality involves a contradiction. 
Due to this contradiction, the dream work produces double conditions for the satisfaction of desire, whereby the split in commodity form serves as the most comfortable means by which to overcome the contradiction between desire and reality. In the apparent satisfaction, an other satisfaction begins to show. An other satisfaction begins to show. This internally double satisfaction is reached through the manipulation of the day's remains, the material that accumulates on the borders of consciousness and the pre-conscious, this gray zone between consciousness and the unconscious. In this intermediate space, we come across wishes that can still be consciously formulated. For this reason, one could reproach Freud insofar as his analysis of dream samples exaggerates their meaning. The discussed cases only contain fulfillments of banal, simple, and naive desires. Freud's dream of Irma's injection, this crown example that is supposed to demonstrate the revolutionary character of his discoveries, unveils his attempts to shirk responsibility for the failed treatment of his hysteric patient. Children's dreams, another example that confirms the wish fulfillment theory, are only concerned with concrete objects, sweets, toys, and so on. Almost all examples seem to be badly chosen and speak against the reality of the other satisfaction. They leave the impression that the desire in question is simply pre-conscious, temporarily dropped out of consciousness and attention, out of consciousness and attention, but did not change its character in any way. It still aims at the same concrete object and remains intertwined with the content of the day's remains. And most importantly, at least for Freud's critics, there is absolutely no trace of sexuality, not to speak of infantile sexuality, and there is no reason to complicate the matter with repression and censorship. Freud anticipates precisely such criticisms when he writes, It will then appear as though the conscious wish alone has been realized in the dream, a concrete satisfaction that assumed a, a hallucinatory and performative form. The emphasis is on the appearance that pushes a certain type of satisfaction into the foreground. This appearance is the same as the one that unites both aspects of the commodity and masks the structural gap between use value and exchange value. In accordance with this, the dream form implies two satisfactions, of which one depends on its apparent immediate meaning and another on its linguistic value. The move from quality to quantity entails a shift in the object form. Lacan's object A, the object of desire, is an object without qualities that presupposes the autonomy of value. Thereby, it becomes clear that the discovery of this object is possible only under the condition of the commodity form in the universe of capitalism and modern science. Before the object of desire appears either as an unattainable transcendent thing, das Ding, that Lacan discusses in reference to the status of the lady in the medieval courtly love, or as an imminent agalma, like in the transference relation between Socrates and Alcibiades in Plato's Symposium. The object A, neither transcendent nor imminent, remains unthinkable outside modernity, and is, so to speak, a modern invention, a consequence of the foundation of science on universal mathem mathematization and of the social relations on quantification and mass production. The hallucinatory fulfillment in dreams shows that the satisfaction was postponed and that the fulfillment presupposes a renunciation of immediate satisfaction, as in the case of children's dreams. The postponement exposes a shift within satisfaction which remains invisible in the wish fulfillment and in relation to which the immediacy of wish relates as a mask. In other words, the manifestation of desire is always mediated, mediated through the apparent immediacy of wish. Desire parasites the use value of objects. We can already notice that the relation between the conscious and the unconscious wish is also inscribed into language. The pair wish desire perfectly corresponds with work labor, just as the production of use value and the production of value overlap with satisfaction and the other satisfaction which can still be attributed to consciousness because its object is concrete, whereas desire appears to be without an object, as long as, as long as it is not associated with the quantitative and abstract character of the commodity form. 
Freud's dream analyses simply attempt to demonstrate that the unconscious wish does have an object because it finds satisfaction in the surplus produced through the manipulation of psychic material. The name of this object is also at hand. It is simply lust, pleasure. Although Freud will soon discover that the status of this unconsciously produced pleasure is more problematic than it seems. After pointing out the appearance that masks the other satisfaction, Freud finally Freud finally oh, crap. Freud finally introduces the already mentioned economic comparison which should illustrate the nature of the unconscious desire and make his concept of the unconscious more understandable. I am now in position to give a sharp description, sharp because the appearance needs to be put back into focus in order to make desire present, of the part played in dreams by unconscious wish. He admits that there are dreams in which the stimulation comes from the day's remains, hence from use value, although this trigger is not enough for the dream formation. For instance, in Freud's dream of Irma's injection, his concern about the patient's state was not enough. He then has recourse to the comparison of unconscious production with capitalist production that is worth repeating here. The motive force which the dream required had to be provided by a wish. It was the business of the worry to get a hold of a wish to act as the motive force of the dream. The position may be explained by an analogy, a daytime thought, may very well play the part of entrepreneur for a dream. But the entrepreneur, who, as people say, has the idea and the initiative to carry it out, can do nothing without the capital. He needs a capitalist who can afford the outlay, and the capitalist who provides the psychical outlay for the dream is invariably and indisputably, whatever may be the thoughts of the previous day, a wish from the unconscious. Freud does not say what the Freudo Marxists will claim later, that the unconscious explains capitalism. He states precisely the opposite. It is, it is capitalism that elucidates the unconscious. The unconscious discovered in the interpretation of dreams is nothing other than the capitalist unconscious. The intertwining of unconscious satisfaction with the structure and the logic of the capitalist mode of production. Freud seems to make a similar move as Saussure, the reference to the capitalist and the entrepreneur, homo economicus, makes the entire comparison sound more like Freud with Smith rather than Freud with Marx. According to the classical economic liberalism, the encounter between the capitalist and the laborer takes place in a free space of equal opportunities and is actualized through the act of exchange, money for commodity, one abstraction for another. The same encounter echoes in the unconscious. Psychic energy is exchanged for the idea contained in the day's residues. We can mention in passing that in one of his later texts, Freud will describe the psychic energy in the meantime renamed libido as the standard currency of psychic life. Everything can be translated into this mental general equivalent. The situation is nevertheless more complex than Freud's comparisons seems to suggest. Unconscious labor is incompatible with homo economicus, so it does not even appear in the comparison. However, the discussion of dreams leaves no doubt that the only essential thing in dreams is the dream work that has influenced the thought material. In Freud's example, the association of the capitalist with the wish from the unconscious is more crucial because it exposes an essential feature of the capitalist. Unlike the entrepreneur who conserves the reference to the economic subject of cognition, the capitalist is identified with decentralized desire. Which brings the comparison closer to Marx's description of the capitalist as the personification of the impersonal and systemic imperative of constant growth and of profit making. Freud also mentions other possible relations between the capitalist and the entrepreneur from their complete difference, their lesser or greater overlapping, to situations in which several entrepreneurs address the same capitalist or several capitalists support the same entrepreneur. These combinations do not change anything in the underlying relation itself, though they do blur the fact that Freud constantly speaks of unconscious desire in the singular. There's no multiplicity of desires, in contrast to wishes, 
but one single unconscious desire which comes down to one insatiable imperative. It also becomes apparent that the singular desire does not imply a subject. Desire is precisely a process without a subject. Rather than explaining unconscious production, the comparison focuses on the appearance. The actual complication emerges when the labor theory shows that the unconscious is split between desire and labor. This double character contains a further aspect that distinguishes the Freudian notion from other possible conceptions. First, the unconscious is placed in a relation of dependency on the social structure. Then this mark is interpreted as a contradiction, the constitutive, constitutive split of one into two that Freud already pushed into the foreground in his early work through the notion of the psychic conflict. When Freud applies the social link between the capitalist and the laborer to the unconscious, he literally repeats Marx's move in Capital, where they are both progressively detached from the psychological personages, describing processes rather than persons. The unconscious desire shows that the capitalist enters the stage as an anomaly in the field of mastery, a headless master. As already mentioned, Freud classifies the dream work by four basic operations. <clears throat> His analysis shows that these operations take place on two very different levels. The ground level is the condensation work and the displacement work. The two fundamental aspects of unconscious labor that match the two main linguistic operations, metaphor and metonymy. Freud privileged these processes in another comparison with social labor. Dream displacement and dream condensation are the two skilled workers to whose activity we may in essence ascribe the form assumed by dreams. The processes appear as a form of knowledge, savoir faire, knowledge without reflection, unknown knowledge. This is what differentiates the unconscious laborer from the entrepreneur, who still remains in the paradigm of the subject, of cognition, for which political economy assumes that it possesses knowledge both of his or her inner interests and of the external market relations. The other two operations, consideration of rep representability and secondary elaboration, appear as a repetition of condensation and displacement within the imaginary. Freud points out that this imaginary dimension is not reducible visualization, when during his discussion of secondary elaboration he evokes the very same lines in Hain that will three decades later serve him in his critique of Weltanschauung. The thing that, dis that distinguishes and at the same time reveals this part of the dream work is its purpose. This function behaves in this manner, which the poet maliciously ascribes to philosophers. It fills up the gaps in the dream structure with shreds and patches. As a result of its efforts, the dream loses its appearance of absurdity and disconnectedness and approximates to the model of an intelligible experience. But its efforts are not always crowned with success. The second stage of dream formation is related to this totalization. Here the dream receives consistency in narration, which makes it comparable to the intellectual construction of worldviews, and even more so with the use value of commodities. But the tendency of labor is not necessarily the same as in metaphor and metonymy, since it tries to fill the gap between use value and exchange value, between meaning and value of the unconscious formation. Freud underlines this minimal discrepancy by indicating that the task of secondary elaboration is to establish the appearance of absurdity which becomes striking once the value of jouissance, as Lacan translates exchange value in seminar 14, is entirely separated from meaning. On the level of secondary elaboration and the consideration of re representability, the value of dreams appears in their meaning. Jouissance assumes the form of jouissant, enjoyed meaning to refer to another Lacanian wordplay. When Lacan replaced Saussure with Marx, he directed psychoanalysis back to the figure of the unconscious laborer and thereby radicalized the implications of his own introduction of the subject. This orientation is most lucidly formulated in television, where Lacan leaves no doubt that psychoanalysis and the critique of political economy come across the same subject. Does the unconscious imply that it be listen listened to, 
to my mind, yes, but this surely does not imply that without the discourse through which it exists, one judges it as knowledge that does not think or calculate or judge, which doesn't prevent it from being at work, as in dreams, for instance. Let's say that it, that it is the ideal worker, the one Marx made the flower of capitalist economy in the hope of seeing him take over the discourse of the master, which, in effect, is what happened, although in an unexpected form. There are surprises in these matters of discourse, and that is indeed the point of the unconscious. Le fait de l'inconscient. That the unconscious implies listening does not make psychoanalysis a dialogue in which it would regress back to some abstract and ideal communicative model, as various forms of psychologies and psychotherapies have done. What is at stake is that the truth regains the powers of speech. The subjective manifestations of its speech are inhibitions, symptoms, and anxieties that the discourse causes in the body. The speaking truth, the power of truth to be more than mere facticity or truth value, is the main terrain where psychoanalysis encounters Marxism, and the figure of the laborer is the privileged conceptual embodiment of this encounter. Practically all of Lacan's texts from 1969 onwards address this intertwining of the unconscious subject and the capitalist laborer, thereby indicating that the transformation of the subject that psychoanalysis strives to produce in its praxis stands in immediate cont continuity with the political question of social change. It is not surprising that television defines one of the psychoanalytic one of the psychoanalytic goals as the way out of capitalist discourse, to which Lacan adds that it will not constitute progress if it happens only for some. In political matters, psychoanalysis envisages the same universalism as Marxist politics. Lacan condenses Freud's analysis of the relation between unconscious desire, dream work, and capitalism by speaking of the ideal laborer, an expression that explores the flip side of the homology between unconscious production and capitalist production. The ideal laborer is not the same as the subject of alienation. It stands for the multiplicity of operations that take place among the signifiers, to which a decentralized form of knowledge can be attributed. The ideal laborer does not know itself as a form of knowledge, but this does not prevent it from accomplishing its task. The subject of labor only enters the stage as far as the unconscious does not merely imply labor, but also listening, the enunciation of truth that sabotages the auto automatism of unconscious knowledge, of knowledge as means of jouissance, that is, as means of production. The subject of the unconscious, by contrast, is a disturbance in the regime of knowledge, an anomaly that articulates its enunciation through the symptom. There is only one social symptom. Each individual is really a proletarian. That is, it has no discourse of which to make a social link. In other words, a semblant. The real status of each individual as subject in the capitalist mode of production coincides with what Marx strives to address through the proletariat. The proletarian is the subject as a response of the real. Here we again encounter the echo of Marx's subject hypothesis that orthodox Marxism later abolished through the identification of the proletariat with the subject of knowledge. To paraphrase Hegel, the worldview Marxism theorized the proletarian merely as substance, class consciousness, and no longer as subject, labor power. Instead of transforming the capitalist subject, class consciousness transformed the ideal laborer, making of its unknown knowledge a reflected scientific knowledge. This too is the surprise that Lacan alludes to in television. The historical and the structural development goes from the master's discourse, whose modern version is capitalism before the second industrial revolution, to the university discourse and post-industrial capitalism, where it is precisely knowledge hence the ideal laborer that assumes the position of the master. The same structural shift was accomplished in the Soviet Union, where the knowledge of the party, the historic embodiment of the proletarian class consciousness, became the privileged discursive agent. Lacan's conclusion is thus, the proletarian is the subject of the unconscious. Marx and Freud undoubtedly placed their wager on the revolutionary potential of this figure. For Marx, the political task of the industrial proletariat consists in its realization. 
that is, its self-abolition through the abolition of labor power, which would produce a new social link and a new figure of subjectivity. Freud, too, thought that the discovery of the unconscious would initiate a transformation that is both epistemological and social. His critiques of religion in the future of an illusion of politics of an illusion of politics and group psychology and the analysis of the ego and of capitalism in civilization and its discontents were directed against the social structures that are rooted in the relations of domination. The revolutionary potential of the subject of psychoanalysis was supposed to demonstrate that the ego was not a master in his own household and thereby to overthrow the icracy that marked the modern philosophies of consciousness and on which economic liberalism grounded its homo eco ec economicus. <laughs> Lacan clearly assumes a more realistic position and detects the political failure of Marxism and Freudianism. The proletarian, this privileged figure of social and unconscious labor, did indeed accomplish a social and an epistemological revolution. But this revolution essentially took place in the relation between power and knowledge. The liberation of labor introduced a social system in which abstract knowledge assumed the position of the master. The ideal laborer, meanwhile, changed its appearance and turned into a figure of domination, both in capitalism, the expert, the Eurocrat, and in Stalinism, the party bureaucrat. Marx, in fact, predicted the possibility of such a course of events. In the first volume of Capital, the capitalist transformation of labor is accomplished and the technological organization of production, the inversion of the relation between the laborer and the machine. When Marx writes about the use of machines in capitalism, he thematizes constantly the essential role of scientific knowledge and the progressive social implementation of capitalist abstractions. The importance of machines is not in their material presence, but in the fact that they exemplify the productive nature of knowledge in capitalism, knowledge as a means of production and as a tool of modern power relations. For this reason, Mar Marx assumes a reserved position towards the Luddite movement. His main concern was that they mistakenly saw the problem in machines themselves and not in the new social role of knowledge that these machines actualize in the production process. Their immediate attack on the machines could indeed be considered the flip side of the capitalist fetishization of machines as the producers of sur surplus value. Lacan's ideal laborer translates Freud's skilled worker, condensation and displacement, the logical operations that do their labor without knowing themselves as a form of knowledge. The designation of the ideal laborer as knowledge that does not think, judge or calculate immediately evokes a crucial passage from the in interpretation of dreams, where Freud provides a condensed account of the dream work from the viewpoint of secondary elaboration and draws the following conclusion. Two separate functions may be distinguished in mental activity during the construction of a dream, the production of the dream thoughts and their transformation into, into the content of the dream. However many interesting and puzzling questions the dream thoughts may involve, such questions have, after all, no special relation to dreams and do not call for treatment among the problems of dreams. On the other hand, the second function of mental activity during dream construction, the transformation of the unconscious thoughts into the content of the dream, is peculiar to dream life and characteristic of it. This dream work proper diverges further from our picture of waking thought than has been supposed even by the most determined depreciator of psychical functioning during the formation of dreams. The dream work is not simply more careless, more irrational, more forgetful, and more incomplete than waking thought. It is completely different from it qualitatively, and for that reason not immediately comparable with it. It does not think, calculate, or judge in any way at all. It restricts itself to giving things a new form. The double character of unconscious labor is striking, but the actual object of dream work is the form and not the content, the very same form that supports the satisfaction of unconscious desire. The transformation of pre-conscious material involves the production of appearance that will not only lead to the satisfaction of desire, but will literally make desire in a wish, or literally mask desire in a wish. 
dream work essentially consists in creating the conditions for this masking, which also codifies other satisfaction into satisfaction, exchange value into use value, and finally jouissance into pleasure. Dreams are wish fulfillments, is therefore anything but an innocent statement. The supposedly enigmatic character of dreams is of no particular interest to Freud. He explains it as an effect of the form of the dream itself. This is why psychoanalysis does not interpret dreams by giving them meaning. The hermeneutic strategy would focus on the content and in doing so, overlook the mechanism of the dream production, the labor and the subject of labor. Thereby, it would fetishize dreams by attributing them a deeper meaning. It is interesting to observe how Freud rejects the appearance of enigma and the postulate of rationality in the procedures of the dream. He implicitly refers to the difference between concrete and abstract labor. Dreams display the pure form of rationality because the labor that produces them is stripped of positive qualities like thinking, calculating, and judging, qualities that still define the subject of cognition. Because the dream work merely accomplishes its task, it is careful, correct, unforceful, and thus ideal, labor without qualities. Something nevertheless goes wrong in this dream factory, and this is yet another aspect of surprise that the unconscious introduces into discourse. Freud soon discovered that not all dreams confirm the general scenario of wish fulfillment. He came across dreams that reproduced traumatic experiences, for instance, those reported by war neurotics or the sexually abused. And finally, there is the famous dream of the burning child that Freud initially took as an example of wish fulfillment. By constantly returning to a traumatic experience, war, abuse, death, and so on, these dreams unveil the compulsion to repeat. With this discovery, traumatic neurosis turns out to be the collateral damage of capitalism. Cultural discontent will immediately become the main theme of Freud's critique of modern culture. The dreams that do not confirm the general dispositive, dispositive bear, the, or bear the character of awakening, sabotaging the production of jouissance. In this respect, the unconscious is not reducible to one single discursive structure. It already, it already raises the question of its exit. When Lacan reaffirmed the linguistic structure of the unconscious, he introduced the term that brings together Marx and Freud's analysis of labor. This is the function of sepal, it speaks. The psychoanalytic intervention operates on three levels, thinking, working, and speaking. Discussions of psychoanalysis often mention that Freud's invention consisted in the fact that he listened to the speech of his hysteric patients, who revealed to him the secret of the unconscious. The hysteric symptom speaks and by speaking enunciates the truth of the discourse that, that determines it. This enunciation already inhibits the mechanism of satisfaction. In this, psychoanalysis most directly coincides with Marx's discovery that in Labour II, an enunciation takes place, which articulates the truth of the capitalist relations of production. This is where Marx's invention of the social symptom gains its full weight for psychoanalysis. The symptom is the encounter of the proletarian and the subject of the unconscious, of the labourer and the speaking being.